huge welcome and uh, a very good morning and warm regards. I think it's been a privilege to be part of this forum. And though I expected uh, a little bit more in number, and uh, we are hoping that uh, a few of our friends will further join us. Well, this is uh, basically a presentation, a very, very brief uh, word about uh, what are the advantages that exist in India when it comes to renewable energies. We'll talk about the potential, we'll talk about the challenges, and what are the opportunities in the sector in India. India, as we say, is a, is a promising renewable energy destination. Now, certain facts about India, what makes India a sort of promising destination? We we'll just to run through very quickly about uh, all about energy. And we all know that life would have been really, really static if there was no energy. Now, this could be from potential to kinetic energy, thermal to electrical, sound to light. Everything we see and talk is all about energy. Today, there's a global call to meet various exhaustive challenges which are concerning the conversion energy mainly because of global warming, the change of climate, which is not good for neither the aquatic life nor for the, uh, 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 you know, not for the, for the flora and fauna of uh, the society. And the spotlight clearly shifts to the energy which is clean, green, and renewable. Otherwise, the challenges of climate change, I think all of us are very well aware of, and uh, the greenhouse gas emission. So all the evils which are being part of the conventional energy, we look forward to an alternate source of energy which are clean, green, and renewable in every sense. This is a very, very typical of uh, a social uh, uh, economic demography of India. India is rich. If you see the first photograph that belongs to it's a, it's a house of the Air India's richest person, Mr. Mukesh Ambani. So as we say, India is rich and India is poor. India is democratic and India is chaotic. So India is everything. One sixth of the global population, which is in India, is in the league of its own. So that gives us ample scope of opportunities. That's the total energy challenge for India at the moment. When we say on one hand we have demand, we say that in the next 12 years, India's electricity requirement is going to grow two and a half times. Whereas the sh in terms of shortage, this India is shorted by 30, 25 to 35 gigawatts. 400 million people in India, which are primarily the rural population, still do not have access to electricity. Now on one hand, we say that it doesn't have access to electricity. For many sitting in this hall, it's an ample opportunity. India is dependent on its oil imports for 80% of its demand. And that's when we have this uh, exchange rate between Indian currency and the US dollar, it's a straight away hit to the Indian exchequer. Which means we have to find, that India has to find means and modes to ensure that there is more of self-dependency in its own country and we do not depend up to a huge extent on import of oil. Climate change, a very, very important issue, as we all know. That's a power deficit. Today, the gap stands at almost like 13%. So, the speed at which Indian economy is growing and the speed at which power is growing, they are at loggerheads. So the power requirement has to grow much faster to catch up with the economic growth. Otherwise, the deficit will always remain. And if we continue with the same speed, the estimates are that by 2050, we'll be having a lack of 600 gigawatt of capacity, which is absolutely enormous. And that's about the power cost. The real rising power cost, as I said, over, over the past few years, there has been a very adverse change of uh, the exchange rate between the Indian currency and the global impact US dollar. So, driven by rising global energy costs and in politics, the trend is expected to further accelerate. That's a total power scenario in India. When we talk about total power, it's basically a composition of the conventional power, which is coal, the natural gas, the renewables, the nuclear, and anything which is the source of energy in India. And as you can see clearly, 
coal constitutes 59% of India's energy requirement. That's where we get uh, a power from hydroelectricity, which is more than 25 megawatt as per the definition of Indian uh, power industry, power ministry. Anything which is less than 25 megawatt comes under small hydro, and anything above 25 megawatt goes into the hydroelectricity, which are the bigger uh, hydroelectric plants. So 17% gets constituted by hydroelectricity, 9% by natural gas, 2% by nuclear, and 1% by oil. Remaining 12% is the pie of the cake of renewable energy. So today, uh, the total power in India, 12% is constituted by renewables. And, and, and India has a huge target of uh, increasing this by 2020 to at least 20%. Out of a total of approximately 28 gigawatt, 28 and a half thousand megawatts rather, the wind is the largest constituent. Wind constitutes more than 20,000 megawatts, meaning approximately 70% of renewable power in India comes from wind, which is today considered to be a mature industry. And although the, in terms of figures, you might see that solar is still at 2,180 megawatt, which is 2.1 gigawatt, but this is one of the fastest growing sectors in India today. And very soon you'll see the changes which is happening in solar landscape, probably a few years down the line. The composition of soil solar is going to increase. So currently wind is 20,000 20, uh, 20, plus megawatt, solar is 2 megawatt, 2,180 megawatt, sorry. Small hydro is 3163, biomass, biogas, and the waste to power. So it clearly shows that uh, solar is on its track to grow further, but today the wind is definitely the lion's share, that's the major constituents of India's wind power. That's an over overall view of the Indian renewable sector. A strong economic growth and increased access to power has led to rising demand. India stands consistently ranked among the top five countries in terms of market potential for renewable energy. Ernst & Young, a leading consultancy organization, they every year define a something called country attractiveness index. And India consistently ranks very, very high. It used to be at number four a couple of years back. It has slipped down a little bit, but still very high on the uh, Ernst & Young Renewable Energy Attractiveness Index. India plans to triple its renewability capacity in the next 10 years, primarily driven by wind and solar. The government of India has set a renewable energy capacity addition of 29.8 gigawatt in the 12th five-year plan, which is already in progress from 2012 to 2017, which includes 15 gigawatt from wind and primarily 10 gigawatt from solar. So look at the pace at which solar is going to grow now. That's the growth of installed capacity of renewables in India at a, at a compounded annual growth rate of 19 percent. From 2007 until 2013, see the pace, the speed at which uh, renewables have grown in India. That's a plan-wise renewability capacity addition. And as you can see, after every five year, when we started from ninth plan in the year 2002, the uh, achievement was 3.5 gigawatt. For the 10th plan, from 2002 to 2007, we were at 6.7 gigawatt, which grew to 14.7, and today the f the we are into 12th uh, five-year plan, and we are at the target of 30 gigawatt. That's what we are targeting. Now, renewable energy in various sectors of Indian economy, we talked about energy technology for rural India, where we have a lot of off-grid technologies like water pumps, lighting, biomass gasifiers, etc. We've got on one hand is the rural India, the other hand we have industrial sector, where we have solar water heaters, the solar photovoltaic that's a grid connected, process heat, green buildings, co generation, coming to residential building, we've got green buildings, solar water heaters, solar cooking units, and these are the various sectors where the government of India is giving a huge benefits, they give huge incentives, and idea is to incentivize to increase the uh, usage and the application and deployment of uh, of the tools, solar energy. Power generation primarily, as we said, wind, solar, biomass, and hydro, led by wind for sure, and in transport, the biofuels and battery operated vehicles. Very briefly, I just run through the outlines of uh, Government of India strategy tonight. 
and these are, these are basically have been lifted from uh, the website of Government of India that we have a dedicated ministry called Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. In fact, India is one of the, I'd say, one of the privileged country and uh, uh, one of the rarest country in the world which has a dedicated ministry on renewable energy. The outline of strategy goes like this. The ministry wants to pursue all those initiatives which fit their strength. That's, that's quite obvious. Overcoming the weaknesses with new knowledge and capabilities. Identifying actions which can leverage their strength and reduce the vulnerabilities to external threats. And as I said, one of the biggest external threats is the rising uh, exchange rate between India and between rupee and the US dollar. Establishing a defensive plan, so-called plan B. Resource assessment, a very, very important source a very important parameter in the growth of renewables and the cost reduction. I think one of the key challenges today in front of India is the cost reduction. Because uh, today you see the falling prices of uh, modules and uh, thanks of course you know, to not be forced from China, but, but today the cost of production in India is, is on the decrease. And the further it reduces, it will be more accessible to a common man so that you know, all of us can think about putting a system of uh, solar at our homes. So cost reduction is a big challenge, which is basically incorporating technologies with high future potential, opening the market channels and introducing new business models, continuing improvements in regulatory and policy initiatives to promote renewable technologies, developing and deploying appropriate financial instruments, because cost of raising finance is, is another big challenge. You know, today in India, when we see, when we go to uh, put up a plant or to put up any let's say a solar farm or a wind farm, one of the major challenges is to raise the cost of, to raise the money. And the cost of raising money actually is a huge uh, challenge today. So we are looking at various uh, business models. Framework for robust monitoring and verification for projects and schemes, human resource development, and strengthening of the ministry and its affiliated institutions. Because the Prime Ministry, the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy is all about policies, but there are, there are plans to integrate this with the Ministry of Power so that together they can change the power scenario of India. And similarly, a lot of other institutions, like there is a body called the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. So as we say, to conserve energy or to efficiently use energy is as important as generation of energy. Now, coming to the solar potential in India, in 2010, India launched something called JNNSM, which is Jawaharlal Nehru, which is on the name of our first Prime Minister of uh, Republic of India. Jawaharlal Nehru National Solar Mission in 2010, which is the aim to generate 20 gigawatt of solar energy by the year 2022. Now, as, as we know, the cost of generating one uh, uh, a megawatt, and we talk about 20 gigawatt, from absolutely nowhere. As I said, even today, India is standing at just a little bit of more than 2 gigawatt, and talking about 20 gigawatt, it's a huge number in terms of, so one can imagine what level of finance is required, one can imagine what level of technologies and the, and the cost reduction which is required. So all those on terms of policies, in terms of policies, in terms of uh, regulatory measures, in terms of uh, easy financing, all that is required to reduce the cost so that we reach our target of 20 gigawatt, which is going to be equivalent to one eighth of the nation's current installed power base. So that's the chunk of solar energy is going to be future. Now, potentially an attractive hub for production of solar equipment, and that's the mission of Government of India. We want to open India as a, as a, as a manufacturing hub. So that, you know, one, that's why, I, I don't know if some, if any one of you is following the uh, in this National Solar Mission in India, there's a clause called Domestic Content Requirement, which is basically that, like the recently there were the uh, 750 megawatt worth of projects were, were, were identified, and when they were announced, 50% of that was having Domestic Content Requirement. It's basically to give boost to the local uh, indigenization, to the local manufacturing uh, companies, so that India becomes a competitive and viable production base for exporting to other countries. So India wants to become a hub in production of equipment, 
very primarily just to go run through what this National Solar Mission is all about. We talk about one of the eight missions under National Action Plan on Climate Change. So National Solar Mission is just one of them. It's a major global initiative in promotion of solar energy technologies and applications, and it aims to achieve the grid parity by the year 2022, by large scale utilization, rapid diffusion, and deployment at a scale which leads to cost reduction. As I said earlier, also the one of the major challenges to reduce the cost so that it becomes accessible by one and all. R&D, the pilot projects and technology demonstrations, local manufacturing, which is very, very important for, a, for any country to have a local support structure so that there is a value chain, there is a, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as we say, there got to be a support infrastructure whenever we have any industry. And then we're talking about the phase two of, the National Solar Mission is divided into three phases. First phase is already over, and we're just right on the numbers. Second phase has just started now, and the, for the first year of, for the first batch, the target is four, in this second phase is 4,000 megawatt. So again, after the second phase, there will be a review, so that by end of 2022, we have reached this grid parity, and we reach the number of 20 megawatt. So in phase two, which is after 2017, we have set a target of deploying 10 gigawatt of grid connected solar pump, 1 gigawatt of off-grid solar and 15 million square meters of solar thermal collectors by the year 2017, which is, which is the end of phase two. And then from 2017 to 2022 will be the third phase. And that's the mission roadmap how the grid solar and off-grid are going to go hand in hand. As you can see, the, there's a major focus on grid solar in the phase one, phase two, and phase three. But the off-grid application is parallelly growing at the same pace. And where on the second slide, we have solar thermal collectors and the solar lighting. Because this is where as, uh, we say that, you know, when we said in the beginning that 400 million houses are still without power in India. Now the cost of taking a grid to those remote places is so high that India has to depend on off-grid as well as the solar lighting. The key deliverables from the phase one, we were right on the target, 1,100 megawatt of grid connected and 200 megawatt solar off-grid applications were identified, they were uh, put up, 7 million of solar thermal collectors were achieved, we were able to establish more and more R&D and HRD centers of excellence. Domestic manufacturing became a sudden charm, sudden uh, attraction. And we saw a lot of uh, companies from Germany, from China, putting up their shops in India, putting, setting up their production places in India. And similarly, the institution arrangement for implementation. And one of the biggest institution arrangements is about to, to bring down the uh, in simplified financing. So a lot of foreign banks like KFW from Germany and uh, the US Exim Bank started supporting the projects in India. Policy and regulatory framework, the national tariff policy has been amended to provide for solar specific RPOs. RPOs is an acronym for Renewable Energy Renewable Purchase Obligation. From center to the state level, there are purchase obligations for renewables. And, and one of the challenges, to hard implementation of the targets. Every state has been given a target that out of the total requirements of power, a specific percentage has to be from renewable energy. Solar specific renewable purchase obligations from 0.25% in phase one to increase to 3% by 2022. The renewable energy certificate mechanism has been notified because the state which do not have enough potential, they can buy certificates from the other states, meaning they are committing to the renewable energy. State-wise strict implementation of RPO orders by regulators and exemption from environmental clearance for solar power projects. Incentives and benefits. Exemption from excise duties and concessions on import duties on components and equipment required to sort of set up solar plants. The 10-year tax holidays for solar power projects. Wheeling, banking, and third party sales and buyback facilities, a guaranteed market through solar power purchase obligation for states. And very interesting, we have this generation based incentive scheme as compared to the accelerated depreciation. 
we used to have in wind sector specifically accelerated depreciation earlier, which has been now, you know, part of it has been converted into accelerated uh, into, into generation-based incentives, which is primarily more you generate, more you earn. Reducing the weighing charges as compared to the conventional energy and the FDI, the foreign direct investments in India, of 100% allowed in renewable energy generation projects. So that brings rough uh, foreign technology into consideration, which was from India for various renewable technologies under specific SCZ, which are special economic zones. Payment security mechanism to cover the risk of defaults, because this is where uh, the India commands over many other countries, where any investor has a security mechanism in place. Subsidy of 30% of project costs for off-grid and solar thermal and loans at concessional rates. The challenges and key growth drivers, key growth drivers for India have been demand side growth factors, the supply side growth factors, renewable energy sources towards grid parity, certificates and proactive policies. And the way forward is to create a dynamic tariff framework, simplify the financing, special development zones, industry status for renewable energy, because the moment you get uh, industry status, a lot of benefits are going to come your way. Carbon trading, to promote carbon trading as an alternating source of revenue, development of off-grid applications, localized mini grids, and establishment of reliable ground management. Very quickly, I just run through, that was all about the, uh, the potential and the policies what Government of India has adopted. I just run through the, we at UBM are the organizers of international exhibitions and conferences of renewable energy. And we have been doing this show called Renewable Energy Expo for the last seven years. Come September 2014, we are into our eighth edition of Renewable Energy India Expo. We are from 3rd to 5th of September this year. Just to give you a little historical trend, how the show has grown over a period of time, that's the year-on-year -year growth. We started way back in 2007 from a small base of close to 60 companies and today we are at 500 plus from a, from a base of uh, almost like 1,000 square meters, today we are at 10,000 square meters in terms of net display area with more than 500 companies participating at our show. And you can see how the international and domestic both are now catching up with each other. In fact, in 2013, we were almost like neck to neck. We had 48% international and 52% domestic participation. The so more is the international participation, domestic is also getting a fillet. It's also getting a momentum. So both are going hand in hand now. At one point of time, see the, the, the difference between the two parts. But look at 2013, it's coming absolutely shoulder to shoulder. A very interesting project in Gujarat, we are just an open canal, I'm sure because this became a worldwide uh, attraction and uh, an open canal has been covered by solar panels. Just the 10% of canal has the potential to generate 2200 megawatt of solar power and save 11,000 acres of land while preventing 9 million liters of water from evaporation. One of the very uh, landmark projects in India. That's the overall assessment. What are the uncertainties, the competition, the execution, and on the other hand, what are the new markets, the present market, and the future markets? So that's all about a key strategic market. As you say, India is a difficult market, but definitely a very, very key and strategic market. Just to give you a little more uh, into it, the government, the government of Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu is one of the states South India in the southern part of India and uh, today the scenario is like this, every state wants to become a you know, kind of an attraction. Recently, the, the government of Tamil Nadu has its own targets of achieving renewable energy, of especially solar. So they have come out with an event called Renergy. Now that Renergy event is also being done by us. We are managing it. It's an international conference and expo, which is being held from 12 to 12 to 14th of June. There are certain schemes by the by the, by the chief minister. There's, a, a, there's one solar power greenhouse scheme. We are talking about three lakhs of houses, and a lot of incentives are given for that. Similarly, there's the chief minister's solar power scheme. Like, now, these are the two prime sectors instead of Tamil Nadu, which are catching up, which is the street lighting and greenhouse scheme. The government is trying to give a lot of incentives to 
promote solar uh, deployment and adoption. So that's another uh, event which is coming up. Thank you very much.